Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, you can turn in them to Luke chapter 15 as we step into our second Sunday in our Aftermath series. Luke 15, the whole chapter we're going to look at today, and sometimes we'll look at a a short portion of Scripture and kind of try to get everything we can out of it. Other times we look at a longer portion of Scripture and try to get the major themes out of it so we don't miss the forest for the trees. And that's what we're going to do today is look at the entire chapter, three parables of Jesus in Luke chapter 15. I'm just going to read the the first one for us to set the scene today. This is Luke 15, 1 through 7. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who have no need of repentance. This is the word of the Lord. I was coming home from work the other day, and when I pulled into my driveway, my wife met me, my neighbor met me, and I found out that there had been some police action in my neighborhood, which is pretty rare in my neighborhood, just in the little vicinity around me. We don't get a ton of action, and so it kind of became the neighborhood drama. We were wondering, what's the story? What happened? Who was involved? And it turned out this this crazy thing happened. I have a neighbor that lives near me, and he had a friend who came over. And they were sitting in the backyard, having a drink together, socially distanced, and they started talking about politics. He was a Biden person, she was a Trump person. They were talking about the election and the transition of power. And very quickly, their conversation escalated to the point that they found themselves wrestling on the ground in the backyard in anger. In the midst of this wrestling match, the woman who was there meeting with him had an envelope of cash in her pocket and it somehow tumbled out of her pocket, out of her person and onto the ground somewhere into the backyard in the midst of the rolling around literally on the ground in wrestling over the presidential election. And when they stopped wrestling and came to their senses and dusted themselves off, no one was hurt, but the money was gone. And so she started looking She started pointing fingers, you took my money, it turned into this huge thing, the neighbors came out, the police showed up, and it became the talk of the town. You know, I I hope you haven't gotten any fistfights this week, but but maybe you've sensed that we have a little bit of um, tension in our country right now over a lot of things. You know, we're in the series right now called Aftermath, and I want to tell you something right now, a statement you don't have to write down. I do not believe it's going to be controversial to anyone today, and here's the statement. In the aftermath of 2020, we find ourselves divided, divided, divided over politics. We're divided over the election. Uh, We've been divided this past year over race relations. We've been divided over the government's access to our personal lives. We're divided over masks. We're divided over vaccines. We're divided over everything. We are a nation divided. You don't have to look too far to believe that there is division everywhere. I want to talk to somebody this week who's been alienated from his family ever since COVID-19 because his response to COVID was offensive to them who did not believe that COVID should be taken seriously and a chasm has formed between him and his immediate family that he's known for 40 years. They've just separated. This is a year where chasms have been forming everywhere. And don't worry, we're not going to talk about politics today. We're not going to talk about the chasm you have with your in-laws or the chasm about the vaccinations or whatever it is. I want to talk about something that we see in the scriptures that I believe is an invisible chasm and even more dangerous to our lives as Christians than any of these other things that are so plain before our eyes. As I think about the world we live in and I think about scriptures like the one we'll look at today, I realize that one of the most dangerous forms of division is the chasm that is forming between you and the lost people around you. 
You know, this is one that, that I don't think we think about very often in 2020 coming out of the aftermath of that year, but I think for most of us, this has happened, right? We have, at the very basic level, we've moved into social bubbles. We've seen almost no one, and the people that we have seen have been Christian folks or our good friends or our family, most of whom believe like us, right? Even with Facebook and Instagram and social media and politics and all that, our social media bubbles are becoming more homogenous, where we're spending more time online with people who think like us and act like us and believe like us. And most of the time this year, we're thinking about politics and policy and government, But I think some of the collateral damage of 2020 in most of our lives is that as we've gravitated more and more towards people who are like us and pushed back from those who are unlike us, there's a strong chance that the people that are not in our lives at all as Christians are people who are far from God. I think this is not just 2020. I think this is a natural thing. Right? You can write this one down. This one's a little more of a thinker. I believe that as our hearts grow in affection towards those who are like us, they tend to grow cold towards those who are unlike us. I think that's a natural part of the Christian life. Now, I was reading some quotes this past week from a sociologist about 10 years ago who was talking about this very thing. This is Robert Putnam, who wrote a book called American Grace, How Religion Unites and Divides Us. And he drew out in his book just the way that religion tends to bind us together and distance us from others. He says, on one hand, When we find life-giving community, like we talked about last week, with other Christians, our contentment and happiness skyrockets. In his studies, he found that the Christian person or the religious person who's in deep relationship with other Christian people tends to be uh, 10 times as happy even financially than those otherwise, right? His stats were that a person who's in a religious sect compared to those who are outside of a religious group is as happy as someone making 100 grand a year compared with someone making 10 grand a year. Those stats correlated because as people stepped into religion, their hearts grew warm, they fell in love with these people. God brought them so much happiness through their religious connection with others. And yet he says the flip side of this is that as folks grow in connection with the Christians around them, they tend to grow judgmental and cold towards those who are unlike them. He said those same people who are skyrocketingly happy, I made up that word, uh, are 72% of deeply religious people, Putnam says, believe that those outside of the church are intolerant in their words. Now, I know this is a two-way street. 77% of those outside the church called those inside the church intolerant. But he draws out that chasm that as Christians come together and find community in their social bubble of faith, they tend to grow cold towards those who are outside of the church. It's a natural thing. It's probably happened to you. You probably have neighbors that you don't talk to who are far from God. You probably have family members that you've distanced yourselves from on purpose or on accident. Just happened as you came to faith in Jesus, you just floated distantly from them. You might have people in your life that you're irritated at because they don't live by the same values as you. And as you've grown close to the Lord and close to other believers, you've grown far from those who are far from God. It's a natural thing. And yet it's a dangerous thing. And as we look at the example of Jesus, we see that in his life, this wasn't something that happened. Jesus was someone who had deep relationships with other believers. We think of Jesus' relationship with the 12 disciples, and it was a beautiful relationship. He went deep with them. He lived life with them. He shared intimacy with them. They were vulnerable with one another. He had great community amongst the believing people. And yet at the same time, Jesus had such a beautiful relationship with those who were far from God. He pursued the religious folks who hated him. He pursued those who were on the outskirts of society. He pursued the unclean people. He pursued the sinners, the tax collectors, the prostitutes. He came after those who were far from God. He didn't let a chasm form between himself and those that he came to save. In fact, he was so passionate in his pursuit of those who were far from God that the religious folks in his life began to grow irritated. You know, Luke chapter 15, these three parables that we'll look at today that we know pretty deeply if you've read this chapter before. If not, you should study this passage this week. 
it started with an, accusa- an accusation against Jesus. So there were religious people who were murmuring about him, spreading rumors about him in the text. And in Luke chapter 15, verse two, uh, we hear that, this, that the Pharisees were claiming, this man receives sinners and eats with them. <laughs> this was the indictment about Jesus. This man is not possibly a righteous, holy person because he is still connected in relationship with those who are far from God. Now, we're righteous, and Jesus is hanging out with sinners. What's wrong with him? Now, in the series, we're building some vision for ourselves coming into 2021 out of the aftermath of 2020. And so last week, we asked to build a vision around life-giving community. And so this week, we're gonna look at the flip side of that one, and I wanna give you another question for yourself to look at this week. Here's a question, how can I become so connected with those who are far from God that my Christian friends begin to wonder if there's something wrong with me. And this is what we see in Jesus' life. He was connected with those who are far from God. And so we're gonna look at Luke chapter 15 and learn what we can learn. You know, I was thinking about the, the I don't even know, the, the fight, the scuffle in my uh, neighborhood this week. And there was a lot of things banging around in my brain in the aftermath of that conversation. I was wondering, did the woman ever find her money? I don't know. And I was thinking, did they ever reconcile? I don't know. I was glad they weren't hurt. I was glad no one went to jail. I was glad it all calmed down. But there's a lot of questions that were bouncing in my brain after it happened. As I walked, watched the woman pace up and down the street, as she came to my house and I got to talk to her a little bit, and as I talked to the neighbor across the street, I started recalling all the things that happened in my mind, and there was one thing that didn't happen that I cannot explain why it didn't happen in this event. As I walked away from the conversation, I kept asking myself, why is no one looking for the money? And it seems like part of the human condition that when something important is lost, you turn your life upside down until you find it. That's what you're supposed to do, right? I would expect this woman to be in the bushes looking for this envelope once she realized her friend didn't steal it. I'd expect for the search party to be going around the backyard looking for this envelope of cash because when something important to you is lost, it's just human nature that we turn our lives upside down until we find the thing that we're looking for. Right, this is the theme of the parables that Jesus tells. He, he tells three of them, and they escalate. Right? They start with a large number, 100, then 10, then two. They start with a smaller scale, animals, then money, then people. They escalate from parable to parable to parable. He starts with the first one. He says, which one of you, if you had 100 sheep and you lost one of them, wouldn't leave the 99 in the field and go after it and look for it? And, and keep searching until you find it and bring it home and rejoice. Now this is a, a parable that's supposed to just be, yeah, of course, right? Uh, someone who had 100 sheep, that's an average amount of sheep. It actually is a pretty wealthy person who has 100 sheep. That's what a shepherd would have in an entire flock. This wasn't person that, a person that needed desperately their one sheep. This wasn't a, a big financial loss to lose one sheep. They weren't gonna lose their livelihood if one sheep wandered. And yet Jesus says, even in those conditions, One of them wanders away. You almost stupidly leave the 99 valuable sheep in the field and go after the one that was lost because the human condition, even when it doesn't make logical sense sometimes, is you turn your life upside down to find the lost thing that's missing just because that's what we do. But then he tells the second parable. And this one's a little uh, more vulnerable and sad. It's about a woman, probably a poor woman, who lives in a a home with a dirt floor. We see some contextual clues to that nature. And and she doesn't have 100 sheep. She has 10 coins. Most likely, these 10 coins for a woman like that uh, would be what's called her dowry. This is the money that is left for her in case something catastrophic happens. And if her husband divorces her, if he passes away, if her family falls apart, if she finds herself on the street, this is all she will have to her name. And so she holds onto it deeply because she might need it, God forbid, someday. He says, in that case, when a woman has these 10 coins, probably worth four grand, right, in our society here, and she loses one, it's so valuable to her that she's gonna look and look and look and look and look until she finds it. That's the human condition. That's what we do. 
So I think the first thing for us as we approach the parable that we know the best, the parable of the prodigal son, about a man who had two sons and loses one of them, who takes a third of the money and walks off into the sunset and rejects the family, the, the thing that we would anticipate that would happen is that this son would try to become lost on his own volition and the father and the older brother would set out this search party and they would search everywhere until they found him because when we lose something valuable to us, we turn our lives upside down until we find it. And yet the striking difference in the prodigal son, the third parable, is that when the man who had two sons loses one of them, Unlike the other parables, no one goes looking, no one goes searching, no one pursues that which was lost. The first question we need to ask as we look at this text is, is why? Because this is part, part of our lives as well, right? We understand that you lose something valuable, you're going to look for it. You lose an envelope of cash in your backyard, you're going to look for it. You lose your dog, you're going to look for it. But a lot of times when humans go missing, we just let them go. When someone leaves the church, we just let them go. Someone walks away from the faith, we just say goodbye. Someone's far from the Lord and wandering out in the world aimlessly. They don't know Jesus and we don't care. The question I wrote down as I read this text and took it to heart is, why are we more consumed with lost stuff than lost people? Why are we more consumed with lost stuff than lost people? I was thinking about the story of Jonah uh, in this context. Jonah chapter 4. He he has this amazing preaching ministry. He leads all of these people into faith and this whole town is converted. And Jonah, instead of celebrating and rejoicing that these people came to repentance, he goes up on the sound side of the mountain and he starts sulking, right? He's so sad that all these people have come to faith and, and God has to come alongside Joseph, or uh, uh, come alongside Jonah and he asks him this question. He says, should I not have of concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who don't know their right hand from their left. Shouldn't I have concern for these people? And yet Jonah did not. You know, we live in a region of the world that is a very unchurched, unchristian region. I think 33% of people at last study consider themselves uh, not religiously affiliated. An additional 10% of people in the Bay Area are connected with a non-Christian religion. So 43% of our region don't know their right hand from their left. They don't have a relationship with Jesus, which means that if God looked over our Bay Area, he would say, shouldn't I be concerned that there are 3.3 million people out there who don't know their right hand from their left they're perishing apart from me. We go after stuff when it's missing. But it never really crosses our mind to go after the folks who are lost and perishing. You know, something weird about humans that we probably, each of us, spent more time this week looking for our lost car keys than we spent building a relationship with those who are lost and wandering in relationship to Jesus. It's just there's something weird about us, right? We read the parable and, and we get it, right? It, it doesn't make sense to us for people to go after this lost son, right? People are complicated. People have free will. Coins don't have free will, right? Coins don't reject you. They just disappear. Envelopes of cash don't grow legs and run. They just go missing. Sheep just wander. Humans get angry and dogmatic and walk away. So humans are, they're a different Beast, and yet Jesus draws this out for the religious folks to bring out this question. Why do our hearts not break more for those who are lost and wandering? You know, I think part of this has to do with religion itself. I believe that religion creates an unfortunate divide between godly people and ungodly. I think this is where the parable starts. We have these Pharisees who have this binary of they are the righteous people and Jesus is hanging out with the unrighteous people, right? They probably got this from the Bible, right? Psalm 1 is a major psalm that starts the entire 150 psalms in the Psalter that draws out the path that blessed is the one who doesn't walk in the way of 
the wicked, who doesn't sit in the company of sinners, who doesn't sit in the seat of mockers, but he rejoices in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. The psalmist says this man is like a tree planted by streams of water which bears its fruit in season and leaves never wither. Whatever he does prospers. And so religion creates this idea that the religious people in Jesus' day create this idea that if they can just stay away from ungodly people, they'll be more holy people. And yet Jesus doesn't live by these rules. Jesus, of course, is not walking in the counsel of the wicked like the Psalm 1 would say, but Jesus is dining with sinners. He's eating with lost people. He's building relationships with those who are far from God. He doesn't have this religion that's tampering his view. He's living on the mission that God has given him for his Life, Jesus, as you watch his ministry, doesn't clump people into righteous and unrighteous. Whenever Jesus talks about a dialectic, he talks about the proud and the humble. So we've got these proud religious people who are too good to hang out with lost people, and we've got this humble Jesus who puts on a towel and serves others, who goes into anyone's house, who welcomes him, who has no qualms about spending time with people who would give him a bad reputation because His passion is for all people, regardless of their behavior. We hear this parable, and it feels like the the character that we're supposed to resonate with most is the father, right? The the father in the prodigal son story, if you've read the story, is a a beautiful character. I'm going to read you some glimpses of, of who this one. The father is the character that sacrifices really more than anyone else. I'm reminded of, of verse 12, when the younger son comes to him and says, Father, give me my share of the estate. The younger son is going to the father and demanding his inheritance before the father is dead. So the father has to liquidate his assets, get a third of his property value, give it to the son just so he can squander it on loose living, the scriptures say. The father sacrifices more than anyone else. Kind of the flip side of this, in verse 17, we get a glimpse that the father is more generous than the average person. When the son, the prodigal son, is off in the pig pen eating nasty food, he comes to his senses and he says, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? Right? Commentaries tell us that, that this is a realization that his father is more generous than the average employer. He, he gives people lavish, uh, generous salaries that give them more than enough to live even amongst his day laborers in his field. So this father is a sacrificial giver. He's a generous giver. And in verse 20, we see that this father eagerly anticipates a sinner coming home. Says that while he was still a long way off, while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. (laughs) The son tries to give him a speech, and the father stops the speech. And we see the, the fourth thing about the father, that he celebrates celebrates repentance. He says, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. You know, if you're a Christian person, uh, chances are that you're hearing the story and you're realizing that this is the Father's posture towards us as Christians. This is the story of the gospel. Right? If you're not a believer in Jesus, let me recapitulate that for you so you understand what we see about God in the gospel through this story. We serve a God who is generous and gracious and sacrificial. Right? Our God has everything. He holds the whole universe in his hands. And yet when he saw us lost and perishing, he sent his son to sacrifice his life for our sins. Right? This is the, the passage that we prayed through before the sermon today, that, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He pursued us. He came after us. He gave everything that we might have life. And Jesus bore our sins in his body on the tree, Peter says, that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his stripes are we healed. We serve a father who's not just excited for us to come home, but sacrificed of his own self. He gave his own son so that we might come into faith with Jesus. Jesus rose from the dead to give life to anyone who believes. 
and we see about our God, the same thing we see in all three of these parables, that there is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repents than over 99 sinners who have no need of repentance. And our God celebrates when lost people come home. He, he pays for it. He paves the way for it. He, his grace initiates it. And he waits anticipatingly for those who are far from him to find their way back again. There's a chance that you're listening to this day and we're talking about reaching lost people. And you're thinking, man, I am a lost person. I, I don't know my right hand from my left. When it comes to faith, I don't know this God you're talking about. I don't know Jesus. I'm not in a relationship with him. My life is a mess. I feel most like the prodigal son in the story who's doing my own thing. I'm trying to find my way home. I'm watching church online, but everything is broken and I don't feel like God would ever accept me. that's you, you need to know that God is waiting for you to turn to him. The command that comes in the scriptures over and over again is repent and believe the good news. That means turn from what you're doing, turn to him, and what you'll find the moment you turn is a God waiting to embrace you as you, as you are welcomed home. You'll hear the angels celebrating as you're welcomed home. A feast will emerge in the heavenly places as you're welcomed home because our God is a generous, sacrificing God who loves seeing sinners return to him and who welcomes them back without a question, with open arms. We're actually gonna take some time at the end of our, our uh, sermon time and our service today for, for any of you who's, who's wrestling with this stuff or maybe you need some prayer around this to, to do that. We're gonna, we're gonna create a, a Zoom context for you to go in and connect with some other people. Right? You can even write down the website now in case you miss it later. It's threecrosses.org slash decision. If you go to that website today, it'll bounce you straight to a Zoom meeting where after our service today, even now, Folks will be in there, we'd love to talk with you, we'd love to pray with you, right? to have a conversation about what God is doing in your life and how he wants to welcome you home. If that's you, go and talk to somebody today. If you are a Christian, and chances are you're looking at the story and you don't know who you're supposed to relate with. Right? You know you don't feel like the father. You don't celebrate lost people returning. You, you struggle with that, right? You don't even know if you're supposed to be the father. God is the father in the story. You don't feel like the prodigal son, right? But you don't feel like the older son either. The older son is who the the parable is directed at. These are the Pharisees. These are the religious people in the story. This is the older brother who comes back after the prodigal returns. It says in verse 28, the older brother became angry and refused to go in to the party. So so the father starts pleading for the religious person to break his heart over the son coming home and celebrate that a sinner has come to Jesus. And instead, the older son challenges the God character, the father in the story, and he says this, look. Now, if this is how you feel towards God, take this to heart. Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and I've never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. This parable ends with the father standing in the courtyard and pleading that the religious person would come and celebrate lost people rejoicing. If you're in a place that that you're like, man, that's me, my heart is hard, I'm bitter, I'm angry, right? Let me give you the same speech that the father gave the older son. You gotta repent and come inside this party. You gotta let your heart break for the mission of God. You gotta let your heart break for those who are wandering and far from God. If that's you, you've got some work and prayer to do with the father that your heart might be softened to those who are lost. Yet I'd be willing to bet that, that most of us don't feel like either of these characters. Now, we don't feel like our hearts are as excited as the father's, but we don't feel like we're as cold, as frozen as the older brother. We feel kind of stuck in the middle. We feel kind of numb to the mission of God. We feel numb to lost people who are far from Jesus. We don't really know where we fit in this whole story. It's interesting, as, as we look at the story, 
I think most of the time we're not gonna know where we're supposed to fit because the character we're supposed to resonate with in this story is the character that's always invisible to those of us who know Jesus. I, I think as Christians, we're supposed to resonate most not with the father, not with the older brother, but I think the person we're supposed to be in the story is the prodigal son in the party. You know, all of us have the same story as the prodigal son. We were lost and wandering until God found us and celebrated our repentance and re-entry into his family and our entry into the community. We are currently, if you're a Christian, you are a prodigal who's come home and now is celebrating with your heavenly father in Christian community. You're supposed to feel like the prodigal, right? You're supposed to read the story and start crying because you realize that the prodigal story is your story. You were a sinner until God found found you, and now you're in a party with him. But I think the hard truth is most of us don't feel like that anymore. It's like we've gotten used to being Christians, and we've forgotten that, that we once were lost when Christ came and found us. And I think that this is the reason that we become more and more like Pharisees, like religious leaders, the longer we walk with Jesus, is because we forget that the person, the entity we are in each of these parables primarily is we're the lost thing that was found. If you're wondering how you can grow your ability to reach lost people, if you're wondering how you can warm your heart for those who are far from God, if you want your heart to break for the lost people around you, you need to see yourself as someone who has been found by Jesus. That's what you need to do. You need to learn to see yourself as someone who has been found by Jesus. And we started with this this question at the beginning of the sermon that was kind of a joke, kind of a real question, right? It was this, how can I become so connected with those who are far from God that my Christian friends wonder if there's something wrong with me? I don't know how helpful it is for you to try to live your life in a way to make Christian people angry. And yet I think, uh, I read a quote from N.T. Wright this week that, that brought this question out in a way that might make you think a little bit more. This is what N.T. Wright says about these parables and our relationship to the lost and wandering in this world. Wright says this, the real challenge of these parables for today's church is this. What would we have to do in the visible public world if we were to make people ask the questions to which stories like this were the answer? What might Christians do that would make people ask, why are you doing something like that? And give us the chance to tell stories about finding something that was lost. Right? How can you pattern your life in such a way that people around you are gonna wonder, why are you living that way? And you can tell these stories about lost things that were found. You could talk about how you were a lost thing that was found, and now you are going out to seek and save that which was lost. If you're in a place today where you're looking to build a vision for your life this year around reaching lost people, caring for lost people, I'm gonna give you four things that you can do along that journey. Write these four things down. Number one, you need to view yourself as someone who has been found by Jesus. View yourself as someone who has been found by Jesus. If you relate with any other character in the story besides the prodigal son, the lost coin, uh, the lost sheep that had been wandering and is been welcomed home, you need to repent of that worldview and say, God, help me remember that more than anything, I am a lost thing that was found. That's number one. Number two is this, develop an attitude of humility towards the lost and the wandering. Develop an attitude of humility towards the lost and the wandering. Right? It's easy to look for your keys. It's easy to look for your sheep. It's easy to look for your coin. But we tend to get proud and anger and bitter when we see people getting lost in their faith. Right? We've got to learn how to live a little more like Jesus who humbled himself, took the nature of a servant, and went out to seek and save that which was lost. We're going to talk about that specifically next week. We have to stop seeing ourselves as godly people and looking at the world as sinful people like the religious folks did. And we need to change our thinking to be more like Jesus who sees the world in the categories of the humble and the proud. And we need to develop an attitude of humility and join Jesus in this work. That's the second thing. The third thing is cultivate a culture of belonging. 
This is one thing that Jesus did really well. Uh, we see uh, over and over in the Gospels, Jesus welcoming sinners. This is how he got this reputation. He created this culture of belonging. People felt comfortable with him. Sinful people felt okay with him. It wasn't this case where people who were far from God didn't want to hang out with Jesus because he was untouchably holy. He found a way to be accessible through his love, through his humility. He cultivated a culture of belonging. I think this is one of the biggest things that we can do practically in our lives to create an atmosphere where lost people are likely to be found through relationship with us. I love this quote from Brene Brown who says that a deep sense of love and belonging is an irreducible need of all women, men, and children. We are biologically, cognitively, physically, and spiritually wired to love and to be loved. If we can be the place where folks can find the love of Jesus just in our homes or in our presence or at the coffee shop with us, we'll have opportunities to welcome them into God's household as they open their hearts to Jesus through our conversations. That's the third thing. And the fourth, the last thing for you today is always be pursuing the lost and the wandering. I love looking three chapters later, Jesus gets in trouble again for hanging out with sinful people and they're asking him, why are you doing this? Why do you keep pursuing lost people? And Jesus says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have came to seek and save that which was lost. That was the mission of Jesus. He came to seek and save that which was lost. And so part of developing a lifestyle where the lost are found through you is by stepping into mission with Jesus as he pursues that which is lost. One of my favorite conversion stories in church history is the conversion of Augustine. And if you've uh, read anything about Augustine, this is back thousands of years ago, hundreds of years ago, uh, we know that Augustine was converted in his backyard. He was uh, sitting there uh, thinking, and he heard this voice that sounded like a child's voice telling him to get, take up and read. And so he picked up the scriptures and started reading, and in that moment, God met him. And a lot of times we think of this Augustine story as a story of how God doesn't need to use human beings to reach lost people for Jesus. And yet when you read Augustine's autobiography, that's not how he remembers the whole story of his conversion. He gives a lot of credit to a man named Ambrose, who was the archbishop of the city that he was a part of, who was a pastor who was much like Jesus in the sense that he welcomed all types of sinners to be in relationship with him. In Augustine's autobiography, he talks about how Ambrose embraced him. Ambrose spent time with him. Ambrose mentored him. Ambrose treated him like a son to the fathership of Ambrose. Even when Augustine was far and wandering, Ambrose was for him all the time. And so one of the most influential Christians who's ever lived was converted because another Christian spent time and welcomed him into his community. I, I don't know how that relates with you this week, if you are someone that God is calling to reach out this week, take a look at these four things and ask how you can craft your life differently this year in order to be part of God's mission. If you are someone who is far from God, I wanna invite you to spend some time today and invite Jesus to transform your life. Or you can do that right now, wherever you're sitting, you can just stop and say, God, I need you. God, I am a sinner and I need your grace. I believe that Jesus' death on the cross pays for my sin. I need new life. I believe that Jesus' resurrection from the dead gives life to anyone who believes. You pray to God and he will change your life in an instant as you hand your sin to him. I would encourage you to go and pray with someone, talk to somebody. You can go to threecrosses.org slash decision right now or for the rest of the morning and there are folks in there who would love to connect with you individually and talk about what's going on, pray with you, equip you for your next steps with the Lord. I wanna pray for us. We're gonna sing a few more songs together and I'm gonna come back. I'm gonna give you that website one more time in case you forget it, so don't miss it. Uh, Let me pray for us and we'll move into our worship.